This episode has been sponsored by BetterHelp. The Dodge Viper, a Jeep Grand Cherokee, and this fall, a whole new line of family sedans. At Chrysler, we believe that standing still is a great way to get run over. Now, hold on a minute. If this statement is true, how does a car company went from having a full lineup of various models and several divisions to being owned by another car conglomerate and only offer one model that is outdated and operates in a shrinking market segment? Welcome everyone to episode 61 of the Automotive History series, where we're going to take a closer look at Chrysler's recent years and try to find an answer on Chrysler's great decline in the past decades. Welcome everyone to a struggle called Chrysler. In this business, you lead, follow, or get out of the way. Well, that remains to be seen. <sighs> All right, let's um, break out the old graph paper and uh, draw some lines. When you put the main players of the American car industry, so the big three, on a graph that shows their general performance all throughout the last century, it looks pretty much like this. And general performance is whatever you want it to be. Total sales, revenue, profit, amount of cars produced, or bringing new ideas to the market. I like to think that General Motors and Ford always duke it out to get to first place. GM's greatest hits are cars like the Chevrolet Corvette in the 1950s, the Pontiac muscle cars in the 1960s, and, um, well, they made probably something interesting in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But they also had their low points, like the Chevy Corvair, the Chevy Vega, and the Cadillac Cimarron. The same goes for Ford. Some high points are the T-Bird, the Mustang, and the Taurus, but also their low points like the Edsel Fiasco, the Burning Pintos, and, um, and the Mustang too. And here comes Chrysler, the bipolar Mopar. It's like Chrysler can never really handle a steady course. They either go full steam ahead, past the competition, or they are on the verge of collapsing. It's, it's either one of the two, with almost no in-between. Think of the wonderful forward lookers, followed by the disastrous early 60s models, the awesome muscle cars, followed by the stubborn choice to stick to land yards in the 70s, be almost bankrupt by 1980, and totally making a comeback with the K cars and the minivans thereafter. And this is our starting point. As you just saw, Chrysler as a company experienced quite some stressful times. And I can relate to that. Doing YouTube right next to a regular job can also be stressful at times. But to let my mind relax, I like to hang out with friends and talk to them. But sometimes when I'm really struggling, I don't want to place a burden on them. And in that case, it can help to talk to a professional. Today's sponsor, BetterHelp, is here to give you a listening ear. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist trained to listen to you and give you helpful, unbiased advice. By using the link in the screen or the description, BetterHelp will connect you with a professional with years of experience helping people with their mental struggles. It's easy. You can talk to your therapist through a phone call, a video chat, or just simply drop them a message. And you can start talking to your therapist usually within 48 hours. Let BetterHelp connect you with a therapist that can support you, all from the comfort of your own home. Visit betterhelp.com slash reviews or choose Edsada Reviews during sign-up and enjoy a special discount on your very first month. Don't keep it to yourself. Reach out and let BetterHelp help you. I won't bother you too much with the Chrysler stories from the 1980s, like the minivan and the K car, because I have told you these stories before. To keep it short, Chrysler was on the verge of bankruptcy around 1980, but thanks to a 1.5 billion loan from the US government and hiring the right man for the right job, Lee Iacocca and his leadership, Chrysler managed to turn the sinking ship around and experience rapid growth in a matter of few years. The results of these efforts were cars that became known as the K cars, and these cars practically saved Chrysler. In a matter of few years, Chrysler was back in the green and managed to repay its loans seven years earlier than agreed. The K cars and the minivans, another wonder from Lee and Chrysler, were highly successful and were the cornerstone of the American street scene in the 1980s. By the late 1980s, Chrysler was once again back into the picture, financially healthy and really competing with the rest, thanks to Kay and Lee. 
One would think Chrysler would put some of that money to the side in case of an emergency, but nope. At the same speed they were back in the green, they aggressively expanded. A typical Chrysler move, as I explained in the graph in the beginning of this video. When we go full steam ahead, we go full steam ahead. Usually, as soon as Chrysler comes into some money, it likes to go on a shopping spree. In this case, failing American Motors Corporation, or AMC. This was a strategic purchase. AMC owned Jeep, makers of SUVs that were just gaining traction. Pun intended. AMC also had a relationship with French Renault, selling some Renault models in the US and sharing technology. Chrysler bought AMC in 1987 and gained control over their model series, factories and overseas connections. AMC was then rebranded into Jeep Eagle. Uh, Jeep would remain Jeep, although Chrysler was going to try and expand the lineup of off-road vehicles. And then there was this, um, this Eagle thing, which would be an entirely new brand, because why not? The Eagle brand was created to convert and bring everything together from the relationship with Renault. Some Renault models would be rebadged to become Eagle models, like the Eagle Medallion, which was a rebadged Renault 21, or the Eagle Premier. Although developed by AMC before the buyout, it was based on a Renault 25. And although this is unrelated, Chrysler also had a partnership with a Japanese Mitsubishi, called Diamond Star Motors, and some of their models would also be sold under the rebadged umbrella of Eagle. Lee wanted to mirror Eagle to that other new brand created by rivaling General Motors, Saturn. Eagle was marketed as a brand targeting younger buyers that were looking for something different, something that offers European styling, the latest gimmicks and underneath reliable Japanese technology. So everything was set. We have the traditional American brands, Plymouth, Dodge and Chrysler for the established order. We have Jeep for the upcoming SUV craze. And we have a new brand, selling cars that are unique, look foreign and youthful, selling to those that would otherwise get an import. Let's rock and roll into the 90s. By the early 1990s, Chrysler certainly was on top of its game. It directly competed with everyone in different market segments. Or was it? Jeep was a rising star, no doubt about it. It rode on the SUV craze by simply being one of the first. But that's where the success story ends. The Eagle division was met with confusion from consumers for what it was trying to be, and in an effort for being unique, some buyers saw through it that the cars were a hodgepodge of French underpinnings and Japanese technology, and liked to buy the real deal instead. And then there was the Chrysler Dodge Plymouth Trio, which hung on too long to the K platform. By the early 90s, cars like the Chrysler TC by Maserati and the Chrysler New Yorker looked simply antiquated. They were nice and reliable cars, but hopelessly outdated inside and out. Literal retirement communities on wheels that are stuck in the 70s. Some other models also looked as generic as they could come. They looked just like a car. Not to mention that Chrysler squandered its early 80s money in the late 80s on all kinds of projects, in including something with Lamborghini? Huh? But the economic downturn of the late 80s pushed Chrysler close to bankruptcy, and it had to either adapt or die. Again. And so Chrysler adapts. First things first, much less attention was spent on the Eagle brand because that was just going nowhere. Much of the developed technology and mechanicals were then transported to the other divisions. The K car scheme was also dropped and most Chrysler, Dodge and Plymouth models were redesigned, partially using Eagle's research and development. This resulted in some of the freshest and most 1990s looking cars to ever 1990s in the 1990s, the Chrysler Cloud cars. These cars were a big leap forward in the way they were designed, inside and out. Gone were the K-car looks with stodgy styling and rounded off corners, and in came the soft, round, jelly bean styling that characterized the 1990s. A dramatic departure that was inspired by such rivaling cars like the Ford Taurus. New was the so-called cab-forward design, and I'll let Lee explain it. We call it cab-forward. What we did was move the windshield forward. Then we pulled the rear wheels back, made the rear doors wider and easier to get through, and increased the width. Believe me, this does more than just improve the looks. It gives you a lot more room inside, it rides better, and it's easier to handle. I think cab forward, like our minivan, is going to get copied by everybody. It has to, just because it makes so much sense. And it did make sense. 
Chrysler's performance grew again throughout the 1990s. And to top it all off, Chrysler was so confident they also added an ultimate sports machine, the Dodge Viper. A car that just wants to kill you with its oversized 8-liter V10 engine and no traction control whatsoever. Around the time the cloud cars were released, Lee Iacocca's tenure ended shortly thereafter. The man had to retire as his ideas about cars started to become old-fashioned. Lee was a man with a great vision, correctly guessing future market trends multiple times, but also someone that liked to hang on too long onto his visions. Case in point, the Chrysler TC Maserati. And although I'm convinced that he had some helping hand in the creation of the butter smooth cloud cars, he didn't like these aero cars one bit. When Lee hired the other automotive mastermind, Bob Lutz, which came from Ford, Lee criticized the radical Ford Taurus from the mid 80s, saying that nobody would buy these flying saucers, as people love the traditional American K car sedans with a vinyl top and a waterfall grill. Bob begged to differ, and a rivalry between these two began. Chrysler's upper management decided that this was not the case and proceeded with the cloud cars and sent Lee to a retirement community. But before he resigned, he elected a new president that would succeed him. Now, Lee had two choices. He could choose between two Bobs. Bob Lutz, the guy I just talked about, and he was kind of like Lee's protege, or Bob Eaton, former manager of General Motors Europe. Everyone expected the former, but Lee ultimately chose the latter much to everyone's surprise, and to someone's anger in particular. In the meantime, the cloud cars were a smash hit. Contemporary styling, affordable price, value for money. And not only that, you could find the Viper on many posters in many young boys' bedroom, while Dad went out to look at some of those new Dodge Ram pickups. They looked so powerful with their massive grills, raised hood and retro styling, and Mom was pretty content with her new Jeep Grand Cherokee. But by the late 1990s, things, yeah, you guessed it, started to slide again. It's like a 10-year cycle at this point. Every time Chrysler reaches the end of the decade, it's close to a bankruptcy, only to make a fantastic turnaround a few years later. The reason this time is that Chrysler didn't invest its mid-1990s money in improving their cars, but looking for ways to improve production efficiency and cut overall quality just so they could ship them out faster and faster. And although by the mid-1990s Chrysler was among one of the most profitable car makers in the entire world, especially his new president Bob Eden, envisioned that these great times wouldn't last forever. In one of his speeches, he explained that he expects a perfect storm to come around in a new millennium, one that would take Chrysler by surprise if they keep on making the same mistakes that they did in the last two decades. New global developments would put the pressure on the car industry and Chrysler, and to deal with this pressure, car companies should work together and form partnerships. Chrysler needed a partner. And by the late 1990s, Chrysler had found a partner, a somewhat unusual choice, the German Daimler-Benz, or really Mercedes to keep it simple. At first glance, you really start to wonder what would have gone through both their minds that they found this partnership so interesting, but there were some good reasons. For instance, Daimler had a tough time selling Mercedes in the US and were looking for another way in. It took Daimler a lot of time and effort to make and sell their cars and look for ways to improve their efficiency. Daimler could also access the profitable Chinese market through Chrysler, which already was active with the Jeep division over there. Daimler's profit margins were slim. Chrysler was one of the most profitable car companies at the moment, so not a bad choice, right? And on Chrysler's side... Uh, well, Chrysler just didn't want to die for a fifth time, and any new sucker <laughs> um, uh, money was always welcome. After some back and forth negotiating, the company stuck a deal in 1998, and a new strong global company full of synergy was formed. Daimler Chrysler. Where Daimler forgot to check Chrysler's financial history, and Chrysler forgot to tell that as soon as you leave it alone for five minutes, it is already on the verge of bankruptcy. Daimler Chrysler was going to be a marriage made in heaven, a merger of equals. The wedding was an expensive one, about $38 billion, the most expensive wedding in the car industry at the time. But was it really a marriage made in heaven? That's for you to find out in part two. Stay tuned.